I did at the break look and see if I could find an image that said, I love it when a plan comes together, um, and then realized they were probably copyright, and I don't want to break copyright. But I'm hoping you will see that there are a lot of overlaps between what Morang has said, what Sean said, and what I'm going to say. And I think the important thing, uh, one of the important things is in the title. I want to talk about narrowing the achievement gap. People talk about closing it, but the only way to close it is to have a non-inclusive system. And I'm not willing to go there. However, I think we can narrow it. So what I want to do today is, is look at some of the background, some of the ideas around underachievement and social justice, but I don't need to spend nearly as long on that because we've already had it most eloquently explained by one of the people that's done the research. Some of the research around parental engagement and then look at the way forward. This is just to show that I'm not Geppetto's puppet. I am actually, I'm not a real boy, but I am a real girl. It's the sort of um, research and literature reviews I've done. I don't know if anybody's ever done a literature review as part of something they've done. They're a joy, aren't they? A wonder and a joy. I've now done about seven of them, and I'd really like to not do any more. But um, can I ask just quickly, how many of you are parents? Isn't that interesting? Because all the way through, we've been talking about teachers and parents. We've got a room full of people who are teachers and parents. And we tend to make that divide. The first thing I want to say is that absolutely nothing I say today is meant to make you feel that as a parent, you didn't do it right. The world is full of people who will tell you that you didn't do it right. My daughter works in this field and has been known to sit there in, in lectures and say, well, you didn't do that. <laughs> That's not about it. And as a matter of fact, could you please turn to the person next to you and tell them that they're doing a good job? you feel better? Even if you have no idea who the person next to you is and they have no idea what job you do, you feel better. Now my question for you is, when was the last time you said that to a parent? When was the last time you said to a parent, you're doing a good job, your child is a credit to you, your child always makes me smile, your child is really good with their friends? When was the last time you said it to a colleague? When was the last time you walked into the staff room and said, that was a cracking lesson? Or how did you get them to sit still? I can't get them. Or whatever it is. We need to do that far more often. The research that's up there, um, you can see most of it. Uh, the, the next to last one called Super Shoppers. Has anybody ever done the weekly shop with a five-year-old? <laughs> OK, the reaction there tells you everything you need to know. That project has created little cards that children themselves can answer as they go around the shops. You know, which is heavier, a banana or a bag of spinach, that sort of thing. But on the back, so that's to keep them busy while you're shopping, and it interacts with the curriculum. But on the back, there are tips that parents can take home about how to continue that learning in the home. And they're things like help your child make a map of the living room, help your child recreate a den from their favorite story, that sort of thing. And the final thing I added um, very recently, because the contracts are still wet, but I will be working with Connect Scotland, which makes me very, very pleased. So there are three things I'd like you to keep in mind as we go through, and the first is the reason for the balloons. The first is, what are we already doing? My contention is that there is a huge amount of really, really good practice in this room, but the problem is that you don't know what the good practice is from this school, and this school doesn't know because we have no way of sharing it, and also because as educationalists, we spend our lives saying, no, we're not really good enough, and the world spends its time telling us we're not really good enough. If you do nothing else today, I want you to find someone you don't know and share a piece of good practice that either you do or someone else does. Just share some good practice to your own home because the point is, if your good practice is helping your parents, some other school shouldn't suffer because you haven't shared it. Does that make some sense? The second is, what can we tweak? What can we do better? How many of you have homes full of empty loo rolls and empty yogurt pots that are going to come in handy in the classroom at some point? Yeah, they only let me teach doctoral students, and they don't want to play with empty yogurt pots, but once a teacher, always a teacher. Um, I'm not qualified to teach in schools, but I am qualified to teach in the voluntary sector, which is what I've been doing my whole life. You are extremely good at make, do, and mend. Every time you do a teaching observation or watch someone else teach, you think, oh, I could use that. Well, that's a good idea, or I will never do that. <laughs> we are extremely good at this. So you hear an idea and you think, oh, that wouldn't work in my school. Don't think it wouldn't work in my school. Think, how would it work in my school? And the final thing is, what aren't we doing at all that we could start doing? 
What, what ideas can I glean from my colleagues and the speakers? And this has already been said by Sean, but I want to reiterate it. When I say parents, I mean an adult with a caring responsibility for a child. That is far too long and cumbersome to say every time, so I'm going to say parent or family. But it could be, increasingly, it's grandparents. It could be aunties, it could be uncles, it could be someone with no blood relationship to the child at all. That's not the point. The point is that it is an adult who cares about and for the child. And I came into this from the point of view of social justice. My background is actually theology. I'm a theologian by training. Um, and social justice equity is incredibly important to me. And I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because we've already heard it much more authoritarily. But we know that children in poverty are much more likely to grow up without qualifications. And that thing about having lower aspirations has already, the myth has already been exploded for us. It's not about aspirations, it's about scaffolding. I live on a council estate just outside of Bath. You might not think that there are areas of poverty, but there is a national area of deprivation outside of Bath, about two or three miles, and I live in it. That's not why it's a national area of deprivation. <laughs> um, and it's a wonderful community. Not long ago, I got stuck at work, and I phoned my neighbor and said, I've got a delivery coming. Could you please just go and take in the frozen stuff? By the time I got home, she'd not only done that, she'd fed the cat, and she'd made me a cup of tea, and then she brought me dinner later because she said I was working too hard. It's a wonderful place to live, but it's in the fourth percentile for education. People on that estate don't go to university, except for the two of us, and we are known as the people that can't put their washing line up because we're not. <laughs> it's not about poverty of aspirations. It's about scaffolding of aspirations. It's about knowing what children can do and supporting children to do it. If you have a list in your school about children that made it into elite universities, I would challenge you to take that down and replace it with a list of children from our school that followed their dreams. They may be the best hairdresser in town. Whatever it is, how have they achieved their dreams? Because dreams are not just about elite universities. Please don't tell my vice chancellor I said that. We also know, and this came out from the National Literacy Association a couple of weeks ago, low literacy is linked to shorter life expectancy. Note, note that's correlation, not causation. Okay, that doesn't mean if you can't read, you're going to die early. But it does mean that we have real issues in our society. And I don't need to go through this. But that thing about children in poverty growing up in a family where at least one person works, as Morag has said, that's one of the myths that we have to get rid of, that poverty is about lack of people working, people not working. It's really not. And this is an issue of social justice. We also know that the risks are cyclic. Children that grow up in poverty are likely to grow up in poverty, although it's not absolute. And as Morag said, people come into poverty and go out of poverty. However, what we do know is that the problem is systemic. And you see what I mean by a plan coming together? Um, and you've possibly seen this. This illustration is actually in Creative Commons. You can, you can use it. It was created by a teacher, and it took me three months to find out who had actually created this. But it was created by a teacher, and it was put in, the creative, co in creative Commons. You can use this. But in the first image, it's obviously American. That's a baseball game. Everybody's given the same. Okay? It's like saying everybody has to take the same test to get into this school. Go climb that tree when you're talking to an ape, a fish, and a bunny rabbit. In the second image, people are given what they need to attain. What I'm really after, and this is going to take generations, but I'm, what I'm really after is getting rid of the fence. And this is liberation. And that's what I'm actually after. Let's get rid of the need for accommodations. Let us have an equitable system. But the only way we can do that is to actually address the inequities in the system that we have now. And as I say, this is a generational thing. The better we can do this for the children in school now, the more equipped they will be to do yet more when they get to the point where they're in power. These are not quick wins. So just to demonstrate some of this, your challenge now is to complete this sentence. The grand old Duke of York. As an American raising children in England, I had no idea what was going on here at all. Mary Mary, quite contrary. Little Jack Horner, what is a Christmas pie? You know. But the point is, how many of you did those nursery rhymes with your children? Of course, because you possibly realized that it was linked to literacy. 
but do all of your parents know that it's linked to literacy? We tell them, sing these nursery rhymes with your children, but do we tell them why? Do we make that final step? Does that make some sense? It's about saying to children, saying to parents, this is why it's useful. This dates my children. How many of you have ever read a book to a child and been told off for getting the, noise, the voices wrong? <laughs> okay, that child's probably gonna be okay in the school system. How many of you have mispronounced a word because you have read it first rather than hearing it first? Yeah, halcyon really shouldn't be pronounced that way. Again, you were able to read above your speaking age. Not every child is able to read above their speaking age. This is, these are some of the inequities that we need to work around. And we've been working with projects, helping parents not just do these things, but understand why these things are useful. Often we say to parents, help your child cook. What we don't say is in stirring, you're developing the large motor muscles that they need for writing. And in sprinkling, you're developing the fine motor muscles that you need for writing. You know that, but do we tell parents? Does that make some sense? It's about giving that bit of information. We always talk about how schools are going to solve the achievement gap, and that makes no sense at all. It is not down to schools to solve. Not alone, anyway. And I realize this is an English statistic, but I think it's a startling, startling statistic. We know that the achievement gap based on socioeconomic status in this country is actually much worse than it is in some other countries. And we don't know why. But we have what the OECD calls non-resilient learners, and it doesn't mean that the learners aren't resilient. It means that you can predict people's outcomes by their social economic status. That's from a document called um, Too Young to Fail from Save the Children. It will take you an hour and a half to read. It's easily available. Line up a comedy to watch afterwards because it's very, very, very depressing. But it's a call to action. But if there's ever a call for Minions 3 or something. But the point is, the only way we can actually get some of this work done is to work at a system level as systems, but we also need to work in local levels, which is why it is so wonderful to find out that practitioners are being brought together. They're being given means to communicate with each other. And that's why I want to talk about the parental engagement research, which is not unproblematic, but it's there. This is from one of the NHS protests a few years ago. If you, as teachers, go back into your staff room on Monday and say, I've got five new things we need to do. What's the reaction going to be? Please keep it clean. <laughs> I try not to give schools ideas for what things they can do without giving them ideas about what they can stop doing. We do, have, we do an awful lot of stuff in schools and I'm not absolutely sure we need to do. But we are plagued by what has been called the civil service mentality, which I think is possibly unfair to the civil service. But something must be done. Here is something, therefore we will do it. We've got to stop that. Would you agree that schools have innovation fatigue? Yeah. That's because we keep doing something without actually evaluating it. So your next task, how many of you have diaries with you? Open your diaries to February and put something in February that says, what am I doing as a result of that conference I went to on the 30th of November? We all know what, parental, we all know what CPD is like, what professional learning is like. <coughs> you have a shiny folder and you go home and there's been a fight in the playground and two people have bitten each other and there's a parent complaining and the wonderful professional learning doesn't go any further. That's what we've got to stop doing. We've got to start evaluating what we're doing and seeing if it actually works. Because how else do you know whether you should keep doing it? How many of you have ever walked out of a classroom thinking that didn't work? That's because you're reflective practitioners. We've all done it. That's always worked before. Why didn't it work? You didn't stop teaching. You may have had a large glass of wine, but you didn't stop teaching because you're a reflective practitioner. But the point is we often don't apply that reflexivity to the engagement activities we do with parents. And what I'm suggesting, what I'm begging, is that you take the skills that you have, the incredible skills that you have, because I think we have one of the best teaching workforces around, the skills that you have in the classroom, and apply them to parents. For one thing, you would never do this in your classroom. You would never stand at the front and opine at people for 45 minutes in the classroom, because that's not how people learn. Universities are very good at teaching people how people learn, but we're not very good at helping them learn the way that they should learn. We lecture about active learning. Um, but how do you have those skills? When you get parents in, do you actually sit them down and talk at them 
or do you get them involved? Do you get them involved in the learning? Do you see what I mean? You already have these skills. This is Rabah Rashbash was an econom is an economist, um, and I find this a startling statistic. But 80% of the difference in how well children do from different backgrounds is due to what happens outside of school. It was US big data that he's working from. But you know this. Bourdieu noticed this. We all notice this. You teach your class the same way, and children learn differently. It's not just down to individuals. Some of it's down to what's happening outside of school. And if you are at all dubious about some of the statistics that we use in education, may I recommend Stephen Garrard's work to you, because so is he. And his review on what we should be doing to support um, parents in learning came out a few years ago, and I read it kind of between closed eyes because I was very afraid of what it was going to say. But what he said, what he and his team said, was that parental involvement in their children's learning was the only area reviewed with sufficient evidence for a robust causal model. He said the evidence wasn't good enough yet. I agree with him. The evidence isn't good enough yet, but it's much better than the evidence we have for anything else. How many of you who have children put your children in early years care, preschool, play school, something before they went to school? Yeah. How many of you had relatives well-meaning that told you this is wrong, evil, and bad, and you should never do it again? <laughs> yes. I am not going to say to throw Kathy Silva's work at them because there are 12 technical appendices, and that's grievous bodily harm. But <laughs> Kathy and her team, she's a professor at Oxford, Kathy and her team followed children from the time they were rising four to the time they left primary school. And even at the end of primary school, they saw benefits for it being engaged in that kind of early learning for two or more days a week. But what she really found, and what I think is incredibly important in her work, is what it says on the screen. The quality of the home learning environment was more important for intellectual and social development than parental occupation, education, or income. So there are a couple of phrases I'm going to ask you to ditch as we go through. And the first is, what can you expect from parents like that? whatever that is, whether it's a geography, whether it's from a particular religious background, a particular ethnic background, what you can expect from parents like that is that they love their children. And this, and you see what I mean about a plan coming together? You know, the mythologies we have in the sense of a story we tell ourselves. What's really important is that parents love their children and are engaged in their learning. That does not necessarily mean they're engaged in school. Parental engagement supporting learning in the home is the single biggest changeable factor we have in student achievement. There are lots of other factors we can't change at a school level. We can work to change at other levels. We have got to stop thinking about all parents as the same. If you have to take over a new class tomorrow, your colleague has won the lottery and has gone off to a, a yacht in the Côte d'Azur, um, <laughs> which is much nicer than thinking they've gone under a bus, and you suddenly have to take over their classroom, what do you do? The first thing you ask is, tell me about the kids. Who, do, who needs a bit of extra support? Who needs a bit of extra challenge? You do that because you're a seasoned teacher and you know that children are different and they're individuals. Anybody have more than one child? Yeah, my mother-in-law, who is very wise, says you can raise children by the book provided you have a book for every child. <laughs> and certainly what I could do for my eldest wouldn't have worked for my youngest and vice versa. We know this. You know this from your practice, you know this from your daily life, and yet we treat all parents the same. And we see parents as a group, and we talk about parents as a group. That's ridiculous. We don't do it for children. We need, and parents are just children who grew up. And you know, in the, in the sort of transnational research, why does parental academic guidance make a difference in Qatar, Italy, and Korea, but not in other countries? In other countries, it's counterindicated. But why does it make a difference in those countries? This is a question I ask, not an answer I have. I was recently in Qatar, and I asked this question, and they didn't know either. Um, but they were quite pleased to be told. And the OECD talks about a vicious cycle that we have. We do things for parents, and they don't come. Therefore, we say they're not interested. And parents are reluctant to engage in school because the stuff the school is doing for them doesn't make any sense to them, so they don't come. And we have a vicious cycle. Does that? resonate with anybody at all. Yes. And to give you an example, one of the schools I worked with had how to help your year 11 child with maths and how to help your, how to deal with teenage behavior problems. Strangely enough, nobody came to those because what is it saying about you as a parent if you rock up to something with, about behavior problems? Stigma. When they changed it to, I have a teenager get me out of here, 
It was standing room only. And it's a simple change. Does that make some sense? Think about, you know, if you put something on for parents, have you asked parents if it's something they want, if it's something they need, if it's at a place and a time they can get to? The other thing, and again, a plan comes together. We think about parents as being on the demand side of learning. They're actually on the supply side of learning. Parents are the first and best teachers of children. And we've got to stop thinking about them as learning and over there. As a good middle class mother, I rocked up to the local school when, I, when my eldest was rising five and said, what shall I teach him? And they said, don't teach him anything. That's our job. And I thought, you want me to deliver you a hyperactive five-year-old who can't walk or talk, or OK, he couldn't tie his shoes till he was 10. That's beside the point. But he could walk, and he could talk, and he could interact with other people. But they didn't see that as teaching, and they didn't see that as learning. Can you see why we need to broaden some of these definitions? Another phrase I want you to get rid of is professionals and parents. A lot of your parents are professionals. But can you see the dichotomy and the de deficit that, that sets up immediately? I am a professional, so I know what I'm talking about. You're just a parent. You just deal with them 24 hours a day, all day. So why would you possibly know? You have to be sitting there, sorry. Why would you possibly know about your children? So the question becomes, do we want involvement or engagement? And it's getting slightly cold, so there might be one or two answers here. Did anybody have a full breakfast with eggs and bacon this morning? You're all far too healthy, far, far. If you had, I would say that the chicken was involved in your egg, but the pig was engaged in your bacon, <laughs> right? We want engagement. And this chart we developed in some of that really early research because I realized, and if you've never done research, one of the things that happens is that it's iterative. You go and you do interviews and you come back and change the interview schedule because you realize you weren't asking the, same, the right questions. And I realized after one set of interviews that what we needed to be asking was what do school staff, parents, and young people think parental engagement is, is what's valuable. And when I asked teachers, school staff, this is what they said. It's about reading in class, going on trips, and parents' evenings. And when I meet head teachers, they often say, we've got great parental engagement. We've got 96% of parents coming to parents' evening. A, what about the 4%? And B, those of you who are parents, do not answer this if people who work in your children's school are in the room, OK? <laughs> those of you who are parents, I, I would like you to think about your last parents' evening for your children. On a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is wonderful and 1 is, why did I get out of bed? How many people would say it was a 10? Now, isn't that telling? Yet we know that the vast majority of teachers are actually parents. Yeah, we know parents' evenings don't work. Anybody from sort of six to eight? A few. Anybody one to five? Every parents' evening I ever attended. I did once point get harangued for five minutes about why Caroline wasn't coming to band practice. When she finally drew breath, I told her that when I saw Caroline's mother, I would tell her. <laughs> you know. <laughs> At which point Caroline rocked up and said, Mommy, but no. Um, <laughs> The second thing, when we asked parents, they said homework and keeping track of coursework. Anybody have teenagers? Keeping track of their coursework is a full-time job. I got a phone call at one point that told me that my daughter had missed her French exam, and I panicked for five minutes before I remembered she wasn't reading French. Um, do not name your child a really common first name. Those of you with teenagers, what they said may surprise you. And this was work up and down the country. We interviewed over 100 teenagers. These views were unanimous, bar one young man who was about to do his A-levels and didn't need anybody's help. Thank you, Jack. <laughs> what they said was they wanted moral support. Interestingly, over and over again, I heard, my mum has to ask how my day went. Now, I don't know about your children, but as far as I know, my children did absolutely nothing in organized schooling because that's what they told me for 13 solid years. What did you do today? Nothing. I did change it at one point and say, what did you have for lunch today? And my son went, brown, which may have been accurate, but wasn't very helpful. And I started asking young people, these were all secondary students, and I said, if your mom or dad or auntie or somebody asks you how your day went, do you answer them? Because I thought maybe my children were the anomaly. And I remember a young woman in Docklands saying to me, no. You have to put a few expletives there. She said, 
But she's not home. I go around to all my aunties, and I find her, and I make her ask me, and then I ignore her. But, and it's the writer that's important, if she asks, I know she cares. And that's the writer that's important. So if you've got teenagers, keep asking the question, and let your parents know to keep asking the question. There are lots of different ways you can ask the question. Tell me two things you know today that you didn't know yesterday. Caution, if you've got teenagers, they may know things that you didn't want them to know. <laughs> The second thing was they told us, my, my parents, my family has to show an interest in learning. And over and over again, I got, I'm not here for my health, miss. I'm not wearing these clothes for my health. It's not like it was in the olden days, myths. Doing research with teenagers makes you feel ancient. And there was a group of young women in the north of England, 16, 17 years old. And they had a friend who, whose mother, for whatever reason, was not involved. Dad wasn't around. And they said to me, you know, Miss Wee Ryder, we give her a hard time. We give her a hard time about her homework. We phone her and tell her she's got to come to school. We take an interest in her learning, but it's not like having your mom care, miss. It's not like having your mom care. At which point I was thinking two things. One, these 16-year-old young women have it. And two, do not cry. You are a grown-up researcher. Do not cry. But it was really interesting. They were very adamant, these young people. They did not want their parents in school. And they didn't particularly want subject-based help with their homework. They said that was just embarrassing. At this point, I was having to drop my children off around the corner from school because my car was embarrassing. <laughs> but what they said was, I am here, I am studying because my parents tell me it's important and it's important to them. If you are a parent of a teenager, your teenagers will never tell you that, or at least not until they're 20, 25, 30. But it's important that we let parents know that this research is there. And that's why that research was actually called, Do Parents Know They Matter? Because the answer often is no. And I said this a few years ago, whoops. If you think of education, if you think of schooling as a backpack with lots of places to hang carabiners, we've run out of places to hang carabiners. There are no more attachment points in schools. The only way we can do this is to get radical in the high old sense of radical. Does anybody want to define, to parse radical from the Latin? Must be a few people around that took Latin. What's the Latin root of radical? Oh, the state of education. I don't know. The root of radical is root. To get radical means to go back to the root. And if we had lots of time, or you were my students, I would now ask you to take two solid minutes in silence to think why you went into education. Do that on the way home. Why did you go into schooling? We have got to change the emphasis from schooling. You did not go into schooling, I suspect, to collect data. Anybody go into schooling to collect data? You went into schooling because you care about children and young people, and you want to make life better for them. You've got to stop talking about schooling and start talking about learning. And one of the reasons is that's what we're there for, that's what the children are there for, and that's what you have in common with parents. They want the best for children, you want the best for children, and you are all united in supporting learning. The children's learning, your learning, and the parents' learning. Those of you who are here from school, who have taken a day off school to come here, do the parents in your school know where you are? Do they know what they're doing, you're doing? And if not, why? Why have you not told parents that you are taking a day out of school? You've told that they know that you're not in school, but have you told them what you're doing? I'm going to go spend the day learning how better to support family learning. Tell them that. Share that with them. Does that make some sense? And I think we've got it wrong. In England, we have a Department of Education. They do not deal with a lot of stuff that's education. Is anybody in here a sports coach, a dance teacher, a music teacher, brownies, guides? Is that education? Of course it is. It is education. It's learning with formalized rules. Department of Education doesn't want to know. That is not their job. Learning starts at birth. You can actually buy a pre-birth phonics kit so you can play phonics sounds to the bump. I'm not recommending that you do this, but I do wish I'd thought of it. Um, but learning starts at birth. Think about those first few, in, few minutes with a baby. You're saying hello. You're naming them. You may be giving them a religious comment. Whatever. Learning starts at birth, and it goes on at least until we die. Education is a smaller set of learning that's formalized. It's got some form of formalized rules. Within that is schooling. And we've heard what a small proportion it is. How can we expect that very small proportion of children's time to deal with the social inequities of a system? We can't. 
but that small proportion of children's time and families' time can help deal and support people around that. In an ideal world, everything that goes on in schooling would also be about education and would also be about learning. And one of the th things I would like you to take back is that every conversation at school starts and ends with, what does this have to do with learning? And if it doesn't, stop having the conversation. Or at least stop having the conversation in a formalized meeting. By all means, have the conversation, because we all have lives. When you want to send something home from school, from school to pa parents, to families, what does this have to do with learning? If it doesn't have to do with learning, why are you doing it? How many schools in this room have a newsletter? A little tip, parents have told us that in October they read it diligently and by November they aren't reading it at all unless their child is mentioned. And the same with all those wonderful letters that you so carefully craft. In October they're carefully filed, or September they're carefully filed. By November, people are looking at them to see if their child is in trouble or needs money, <laughs> or a permission slip signed. If it's not about learning, why are you sending it home? Why are you spending time on it? I'm not saying to ditch your newsletter, but I am saying make your newsletter about learning. Suggest ways that parents can extend the learning. Suggest ways that families can talk about learning. That does not mean doing more homework. It may mean discussion starters. And I'll give you some examples of those as I go. At the moment, we've got this very school-centered view. We've got the school in the middle and the parent here and the pupil there, and the school kind of acts as an intermediary between them. And I'm arguing that what we need is a view where we are all encompassed by learning. The community, the pupil, the school, the parents, we are all there worried about learning, thinking about learning, talking about learning. Does that make some sense? Is that closer to what you went into schooling for and education for? We didn't go into schooling and education to collect data. I did have somebody say he went in because it wrote off his student debt, but he was there long after his student debt was laid off, and he was probably one of the best math teachers I've ever seen. So every meeting starts and ends with a focus on learning. Look at what goes home. What are you doing that doesn't relate to learning, and can you stop doing it, or can you tweak it so it is related to learning? One of the primary schools that I worked with sent home three thunks a week, and they were just ideas that were related to the curriculum. Another one put banners in the playground saying, this week we're talking about. There was one point where every school in England seemed to be talking about the Great Fire of London. Um, you know, this week we're talking about the Great Fire of London. This week we're talking about Diwali. This week we're talking about, ask your child about. Note, ask your child about, not tell your child about. How many of you have ever taught something you weren't particularly sure of? You learned when you were teaching about it. And there's some recent research that shows that children actually learn more when they're explaining it to something. <laughs> Parents don't need to know the answer. They need to care that the answer gets found. And that's terribly liberating. I don't mean to paint too rosy a picture. There are some barriers. And we'll continue this. There's a workshop going on. This is from a book called Swing Time by Zadie Smith. And if you've got the paperback, this is on page 41. But it describes how her mother and her mother's friends felt about school. And I think this should be required reading for every teacher trainer and every training teacher. We knew that they, in their own time, had feared school. They feared the arbitrary rules. They felt shamed by them, by the new uniforms they couldn't afford by the incessant correcting of their original patois or cockney, by the sense they couldn't do anything right anyway. A deep anxiety about being told off. Fear never really left our mothers. Parents' evening was, in their minds, not so different from detention. It remained a place where they might be shamed. The difference was that now they had a choice. I find that incredibly powerful. I was saying to someone at the break, one of the problems is that Almost all of us in this room are comfortable in schools. Might be slightly uncomfortable in somebody else's schools, but we're comfortable in schools overall, even secondary schools. Regular people who have left schooling are not comfortable in schools. And they are really not comfortable in secondary schools, which are big, noisy, confusing, often look something like Fort Knox, and are full of teenagers. And we've been conditioned to be afraid of our teenagers. And they are all taller than me, every single one of them. Right? We need to realize that we have, at times, got to step outside of those boundaries. Head teachers always say to me, how do I get them to come in? And I say, why do you want them to come in? What is so sacred about this particular plot of land that it's the only place that you can talk to parents? I remember a head teacher saying to me at one point, 
they won't cross the, the line. I stand there and they won't cross the line. I said, cross the line yourself. Take the step. It's easy and obvious when you say it. One of the problems, I don't know if Maura would agree with this, but one of the problems with doing research is that often you spend years doing research and then everybody says, well, that's obvious. It is obvious when somebody's done the research and tells you. So, yeah. One of the big barriers to parents' engagement with their children's learning from our research and other people's research is parents' experience of education. If your experience of education is being told that you're not good enough, that you are never going to amount to anything, parents are reacting not necessarily against you and your school, but against the schooling they experienced. And you can't change that. You have to build new relationships. And that means you may have to try a little bit harder. And then there are some practical issues. Time, childcare, transport, cost. A question for you, and I don't need an answer for this, but when does the last bus leave your school that will get your furthest parent home? If you don't know that, how are you planning evening events? It's all very well saying they can take a taxi, but a lot of your parents can't take a taxi. Or the money for a taxi means mum doesn't eat. You know, when does the last bus leave your school that will get your furthest parents home? When do your parents celebrate religious feasts? You are very unlikely to have parents' evening on Good Friday. You're possible have it, it's quite possible to have it in, on Purim. One of the schools I worked with could not get their mainly Somali group of parents to come to their, their school barbecue. What do you expect to eat at a barbecue? Roast pork. When they changed it to a family picnic, there wasn't enough room for all of the families that wanted to come. It's about knowing your families. It's about thinking through. Do your parents work shifts? If your parents' evening is on Monday night between 6 and 8, and that's when it is, what accommodation are you making for the single parent or the two parents that work shifts and that's, they can't take it off? Many of us are in jobs where we can say, OK, you know, I'll do that work later. A lot of parents aren't. A lot of families aren't. I would like you to take comfort from this. This is the OECD. There's a, a document called Let's Read Them a Story. 15 minutes conversation a week with teenagers about social media, about movies. Now it would be about Fortnite. Please don't ask me. That's all I know about Fortnite, <laughs> that it exists, is correlated to engagement with literacy. And everybody always thinks this has to be sitting down in a book-lined room going, darling, how do you feel about Nietzsche? <laughs> and I did have that conversation with my daughter when she was in university and reading Nietzsche, and I had to go back and reread Nietzsche, which wasn't fun. <laughs> it's not about that. It's about showing that you care. It's about saying, how's it going? It's about, you saw that in my family, it would have been, you saw that movie. Is that a good movie for your mother to see? You know, can I go see that movie? Because I know you've seen it. Parents need to know that they make a difference. We need to be telling parents that they can make a difference. We need to be supporting parents. That does not mean parents are to blame, and that doesn't mean that this is the solution to the problem. But it does mean this will go some way to supporting the children who aren't getting some of the support that they need. Another phrase that I want you to ditch is hard to reach parents. I was asked by a group of schools, local to Bath, let's say, to come in and talk to them about hard to reach parents. And the first thing I said was, I want you to ditch that phrase. They were not pleased. But who's hard to reach? Is it the parent or is it the school? But can you see that that's immediately a deficit model? You are hard to reach. Sorry, I'm sitting there. You are hard to reach. The problem is not that I'm trying to reach you when you're at work or that I'm sending you a text and you've changed your phone because you got a better deal on a better contract or you don't have a phone. And also, it's not really as important that the parents are in touch with you as a school. What's really important is that they're in touch with their children's learning. The two are not the same. And it's simple arrogance to assume that it's the same. We need to get past the school and concentrate on learning. We need to talk to parents about how we can support them to support their children's learning. Question for the senior leaders in the room. Do you have a school improvement plan? Why? I love it when I ask that because the looks on, on head teachers' faces is always like, why are you asking me if I'm breathing? Why do you want to improve your school? You really don't want to improve your school, do you? You want to improve learning. Have a learning improvement plan. And I, yes, I do know some schools that have moved to having learning improvement plans and it has changed the conversations around learning. And this is back to my point about the conversations need to be around learning. 
We know from research that the most valuable CPD that people do is around the water cooler or the staff room because it's when you talk to other practitioners. And when the, the results come back from evaluations, people always say the best bit was lunch, not just because lunch was good, but because lunch is a time that you can talk to other practitioners. The people who know best about the learning that goes on in your school are the children and the staff. And the people who know best about the learning that goes on at home are the children or the young people and the parents. One trainee teacher I was working with changed the conversation with the parents simply by phoning her and saying, I am really worried about Molly. Name changed. You're her mom. You know her better than I do. What can you tell me about Molly that will help me to support her? Can you see how that is so different from so many other phone calls that mother will have received about Molly? It wasn't, let me tell you what Molly has done wrong. It's, let me tell you I care about your daughter, and that I know you do, and let's go forward together. It's a very different model. model. The message we need to get across to parents, and I'm running out of time, is that what matters is that they care about their children and their learning. They don't need to know the answers. They need to care that the answers get found. So tips for parents that you can give parents, and you will have access, I think, to this. Keep asking how things are going. Have conversations. How, how do you react to a child that comes to you in the classroom and says, Miss, sir, I can't do this? What's your reaction? I can't do this. So what do you say? Yet. You can't do it yet. Or how do you think you might? Have we told parents it's OK to say, I don't know, yet? I haven't figured that out yet. How do you think we can work that out? Never doubt how important you are to your child. And you parents never doubt how important you are. You really need, as school leaders, to have a joined up approach across the school. It's incredibly confusing for parents if it isn't, because when the teacher who's really good at engaging with them leaves, because they've got promoted, because they were good at engaging with parents, parents are then left. And parents have talked about missing their security blanket when they move from primary to secondary. If you're in secondary, please work with your feeder primaries. Support your parents and children over that gap. Ask parents what they want and what they need. Don't assume. Actually ask them. Go to parents. Almost all large supermarkets, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, I won't say almost all of them, but a lot of them have a community room that you can use. Tesco's and Sainsbury's are not terrifying places. Parents will probably go there, Asda. Meet them there. The local swimming baths will be full of non-resident dads and their kids on Sunday afternoons. World Book Day is, if you follow me on Twitter, you know, a real bugbear of mine. Going to Asda and buying a costume never helped anybody's literacy at all. <laughs> Asking parents what their favorite story as a child was, note story, not book, story as a child was. Phoning the oldest member in the family and saying, tell me a story, grandma, granddad, auntie. There are lots of ways. One of the schools that responded to me on Twitter has a cuddle day, primary school, where children can bring in their favorite cuddly toy, pillow, blanket, whatever, and they spend the day cuddled in corners reading their favorite books. Now that sounds to me like heaven. It also sounds to me like what I went into education for. <coughs> there are lots of alternatives. Please don't just fall back on costumes. Think about the cost. Odd sock day assumes that children have more than one pair of socks. Having to wear a specific color assumes that families have that color. Go back to the cost of a school day, which is a fantastic resource in Scotland. I recommend it all the time, but think about it. There are lots of websites around. That should say rewrite. I was obviously quite tired. Rewrite the ending to a favorite book. <laughs> school websites are another bugbear of mine, is your school website optimized for being seen on a phone? Because we know an awful lot of parents will be accessing your school website by phone. Does it actually show pictures of the school? Take away some of the anxiety about what, school, what parents are going to find when they come into school. When was your website last updated? And what does it say about learning? Um, it says staff with pets there. One of the things, one of the ways that you can actually make a connection um, to staff and between staff and parents Put up pictures of staff with their pets. It's an immediate way of parents being able, oh, you've got a staffy. We've got a staffy. They're insane, aren't they? Can you see the way? And also, it helps you bond your staff. When children and parents work together, when children and school, parents and schools work together, children do better. 
We've got to go beyond just giving people information. You do not do this in the classroom. You do not just give children information. You support their learning. We've got to do the same for families. That's only going to happen when we shift from the emphasis on the school to the emphasis on learning. We need targeted, responsible, culturally appropriate support. We need to design it in conjunction with schools and staff and parents and people, young people and researchers. I thought I had people as a separate group there, and that would worry me. Implemented in partnership with families. I've been served lunch so many times by people that speak the parents' languages with head teachers saying there's nobody on staff who speaks the parents' languages. The parents that work in your school are your best advocates. They know how much you care for your children. They are your best advocates. And we need to evaluate them effectively. This is not just jobs for the girls here. We actually do need to evaluate what we do. Does anybody remember that? It's from The Hunt a couple of years ago, David Attenborough. Every foot in the country came off the floor because he showed us that an octopus could pull itself out of a rock pool and schlep across dry land. We are not safe. Octopus can come out, right? How many hundreds of thousands of conversations on the way to school the next morning were mom, dad, auntie, uncle, did you know an octopus could come out of the water? That's home learning. We trust a geologist to tell us about octopus. That's home learning. We can have those conversations around planet Earth too. He's got a new series out at the moment. Are you sending home questions that parents can discuss with their children about the new David Attenborough, which I think is called Dynasties, I think. But can you see how that's a home learning experience? We know more people watch David Attenborough than watch the final of The X, X Factor. Now, they probably taped The X Factor, but. It doesn't exist in education if it doesn't have an acronym. That's parental engagement with children's learning can help us to break the cycles <laughs> of poverty and underachievement. Help. It is not the answer. The answer is systemic, but it can help. But only when on based on the foundations of respect and trust between parents and schools, schools and communities. My final comment is from something we said a few years ago. Schools have got to put parental engagement at the center of what they do. Go home and look at your teaching and learning policy. Where are parents? If you actually believe that parents are central to children's learning, they've got to be central to the teaching and learning policy. And my suspicion is that they aren't. Do not rewrite your teaching and learning policy to include parents without including parents. <coughs> yes, parents can help you rewrite a school policy. I'm not going to say the journey starts here. I think the journey continues here because you're already doing good work. I keep saying to people, can I please have a room full of head teachers that don't want to listen to me talk? Because the people that come to listen to me talk have already decided that this is important. I want a group of people who would pay not to listen to me so I can convince them. <laughs> this was published yesterday. You have the flyers about it. Um, do contact me. That's my email address. Please note there are three Drs. Janet Goodall working in England. I am not the woman that deals with children's palliative care. I am not the woman that deals with the Gospel of John, and I have absolutely nothing to do with great apes. That is a different good all altogether. You can follow me on Twitter. Academics work has to be made freely available if it's going to be counted the way it's counted. So always go to an academic's website. Most of their work will be there freely available, and that's mine. And I would leave you, I hope, with what we're trying to achieve, which is happy, confident children in happy, confident families. Thank you very much.